Hi, I'm Sarah O'Connell and I'm the facilitator of the North Canterbury Farming for Profit program. We are working through a webinar series on working dogs uh, and we are doing this with Laurie Linney from Vet Life and, and the Teammate project that she has been working on for a number of years. Uh, we're about to dive into buying a dog and what the ins and outs are of buying a dog. So Laurie is going to talk us through this. Laurie, take it away. Righto. This, um, this is a wee bit of uh, editorial personal opinion. So please, this doesn't, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is only one man's opinion. Um, I, I think certainly with um, having hands on, I mean, I examine dogs every day, but certainly examining 640 dogs um, over those years. I mean, like I certainly didn't do them all that much, but I think my, the number of dogs I examined each time was about between 100 and 150 dogs every six months. Um, so it was very interesting following animals as far as the injuries that they had, the arthritic changes that they had, the joint range of motion changes that they had, and how that affects their ability to complete work and, um, and how those things progressed. Um, dogs are getting expensive. You know, we, um, we found that um, about half the dogs people paid money for, <laughs> um, half, about well, 40% of them were free and the others were traded for some amount of alcohol or um, dog food or whatever, um, but something was something was bartered for for the for the change in dogs. But you know, a, a working dog now, um, a tra fully trained working dog can cost you thousands of dollars. So I guess I get concerned when people tell me how much they paid for a dog, and I put my hand on it. And I think, Ooh, you know, there's maybe some consideration can be made for. For, for things that might limit their, their working life. And can you make those predictions? No, you can't. Like if I, if I could make those predictions, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you now. I'd be in the Bahamas somewhere. But, but certainly if you find some things in a dog's, um, you know, restrict your range of motion of some of the joints, um, you know, signs of arthritic change, then you might think, well, maybe this dog isn't exactly worth as much as they're asking for it and maybe I can, talk to the guy about it and we can make a deal. I don't know. Um, but I think those are some of the things we need to consider. I mean, if you've got a car that needs its cam belt change, then you're probably not going to be as willing as willing to spend as much money as you would if it didn't. So in my mind, that's how you might look at buying a dog. Cost of a dog certainly depends on the age and stage of training. Um, you know, an untrained dog isn't worth a lot of money. A lot of money. Um, partially trained dogs worth a little bit more, and certainly a fully trained, ready to go push button dog is worth a lot of money these days. So things you got to consider between, um, you know, if that dog's going to be fit for your purpose. I mean, ultimately, the relationship between the owner and dog is a big one. Whether or not that dog's going to work for you, and that's something you never know until you. Do you get it home? There's some dogs and some people that just don't get along. And that's something that that trial period, um, when you buy it, certainly will hopefully cover that. Um, you know, confirmation, I don't think, I see a lot of dogs out there that have really crappy confirmation and they've worked every day of their life and they've never missed a day of work. Most of those dogs have uh, a lot of arthritic change but mate, they're just so tough, they'll, they'll, they'll never miss a day of work. Um, but there are some confirmational things that you can watch out for, and you know, especially if you're getting an untrained dog that you might think, Ooh, maybe I don't want to get into that and I'll look, look further for, for an animal that maybe has good confirmation and less likely to have those sorts of problems. Um, identifying wear and tear injuries, um, you know, big, big joints, um, joints that have got not full range of motion, um, signs of injury. Uh, the people usually tell you what's going on, but some, some people don't. Some people just need to be asked and they'll offer that information if you, if you ask. And I think there's sometimes, sometimes we don't ask those questions and, and it's something that maybe we, we need to do. Ultimately, buying a dog of, of any sort is, is barbed wear and you, when you're 
put your hands on a dog, you need to know what's normal. Um, and that's certainly something that a lot of our veterinarians, um, you know, you compare a, a dog that's eight months old to a dog that's eight years old, and, and you can certainly see where, where changes happen. Um, you know, we found 30% uh, of the dogs would have um, musculoskeletal issues in their back legs and about 20% in their front legs. Um, and that's over all age groups. But certainly the instance of some of those injuries would affect uh, the chances of them being around six months later when we examine them again. So those are things you need to consider. Send, you know, you always get a dog that's got a lot of those problems, but, but doesn't cause you any problems. Um, you know, never, like I said, never misses a day of work, but if you're spending big money on a dog, then you need to look at and consider some of those things. These, I've got a couple of pictures of just some of the stuff that, that we um, came up with. That foot um, on the right hand side there, you can see that dog's got really huge metacarpal, so uh, finger joints basically, that's his front foot. And he's got great big fat knuckles. Um, that dog could barely bend his knuckles and they often, you see those dogs and they've got quite splayed wide feet. Um, you watch him walk over a gravel drive and you know for sure that that really, really hurts. Um, those dogs tend to have problems as you go on um, with being dang uncomfortable and, and slow when it comes to, to catching anybody that they're supposed to be chasing. You know, lumps and, lumps and bumps are things that, you, that even anybody can see. You don't have to be super trained. I mean, this, a lot of dogs, nice part about dogs is they come with two of everything. See this, um, this Achilles tendon insertion on this dog here. This one looks pretty normal. That one, not so much. Tendon's really fine and tight. That one, not so much. And then problems like that, those, um, especially, I mean, tendon problems are, are often worse in that they tend to, to, to cause a, a subtle lameness, but certainly a significant problem. And they're a lot slower to heal than, you know, better off to break a bone than you are to have a, a really bad strain tendon. And again, that's, um, that's a, a dog with a, a great big swollen carpus. So a swollen hawk, pardon me, let's get the right joint there. Um, and again, that tells you that that dog has got, if you put your hand on it, that's hard. That, that dog has um, not just, that's not soft swelling around that, that joint, that's hard. And so it particularly has got um, arthritic change in that joint. And if, you bend, if you flex and extend that joint, you'll find it doesn't go anywhere near where it used to. So I just think it's something that, that we need to consider when we're, we're looking at dogs and, and deciding whether or not they're the ones for us is that those are some of the things that might bite us. And again, if you aren't sure about it and you want an opinion, you can, you can always um, ask somebody to give you a hand. So that's me in a nutshell. I mean, uh, again, the, the buying a dog is always uh, ultimately up to the person buying it. Um, so yeah, just my thoughts on the matter. Cool. Good work. Sweet. Well, we've got a few more questions um, come in. So one is around that... Um, um, we've got a new heating pup. Uh, what are some things to think about um, to give it the right start? Um, I look, if you were gonna, if you were struggling with um, feeding, with feeding really good quality diet to all of your dogs, the ones that really need it are your babies. So you know, grow your puppies as best you can. If you feed them a good quality, reputable puppy diet for the first 12 months of their life. Um, that's gonna get you past the limitations with a poor quality diet. So you wanna make sure you're using something that's, um, that's designed for a purpose. So if you've got um, a great big North Island Honeyway, you wanna feed it a large breed puppy diet. Um, most heading dogs, um, fall into that medium to, to large breed, depending on how, what size they are. Um, so, and again, feed to body condition. And just be careful how much hard exercise you're going to give them when, when they're young. Generally, when pups are young, they tend to get short, sharp bursts. 
Um, you know, they get small periods of not too intense exercise and that's exactly what they need. You know, it's no different than, than us. If you go out and you run 20 Ks, you're tired. But if you went out and you ran, you know, a K 10 times a day, you're not so tired because you don't, you know, you, it's, it's a small amount of exercise. You have a chance to recover and you don't end up with those fatigue type injuries. So don't overexercise your puppies and make sure you feed them properly for that first year life at least. So how quickly could you get them working on farm? Well, yeah, I mean, most pups, they, they've got to be trained for a start. Um, and it usually takes, well, depends, depends on the pups. Some of them, it takes a lot longer than a year to get them there. But, you know, most dogs take that amount of time. They've got short attention spans. Um, there's only so much pressure you can put on them. Um, so they tend not to get overworked because of that. Um, and most of the time puppies are an up and coming in a dog team. So your mainstays are doing most of the work and hopefully teaching your puppies on the way through. Um, and your puppies are getting little and often rather than um, a whole bunch of work and tearing them out. Okay. And as part of another question that's just come through direct to me is, um, can feeding too much at a young age cause joint issues? Yes. So overfeeding can cause disproportionate growth between your ligaments and your bones um, and, a, and affect cartilage growth. So you, you don't want to overfeed. It's, it's, you can put too much energy in and, and cause problems that way, especially, especially front legs um, that they tend to go over on their carpuses or back on their, back on their carpuses and when you back off on the tucker a little bit and slow down the exercise keep them on soft ground then it can correct a lot of those things cool so here's a good question that kind of follows on a little bit from confirmation um what percentage of dogs in the study would you say had significant inherited confirmation issues oh <laughs> that's a good question that's a really good question couldn't quantify that for sure you know get familiar with 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 certain types of things that that you see every day um you look yourself you'll have a team of dogs and you'll have you know dogs that are out at the elbows and can cow hopped and and all sorts of things um some of those dogs never have a problem in life um but some of those confirmational faults will create problems more frequently in dogs that have confirmation like that than it will in a dog with lovely straight legs okay <laughs> When it comes to the dogs that are sore, do you let them just carry on as normal or is it better to restrict them on days when they are a lot sore, even if they highly protest being left out of the action? <laughs> they always protest. You know, they're <laughs> kind of like the Black Knight in Monty Python. You know, they'll keep going regardless. Um, I, I think you need to think for them because they just, most, like a lot of those dogs would, you know, they'd work till they dropped easily. Um, if you've got a dog that's, you think about if you were really, really sore, well, the chances of you hurting yourself further um, are higher if you're really, really sore while you're working um, than it is if you're not. So if you're comfortable, then you're not, then you're moving your legs much more naturally. Um, your muscles are moving more properly and supporting your joints. Whereas if you're kind of cheating and mincing around, a dog's four wheel drive and they can, they can really cheat. Um, you know, people say, oh, well, my, well, my dog walks and trots, it looks a bit lame, but when he runs, he's, there's no problem at all. And that's because when, when you do those fast gates and, and multiple or gates where they share a load, like a canter or a gallop on a dog, um, they'll share the load between those fine legs. And actually what they're doing is dropping their good hind leg, just a fraction of a section before their sore hind leg. And actually they ain't weight bearing on that sore hind leg hardly at all. It doesn't look like it. And they run really fast on three legs. You can see a three legged dog and see that, but they're sore. So, I mean, I guess, look, ultimately, I mean, in a perfect world, you, you don't, wouldn't do that. You wouldn't exercise a, a sore dog, but in, in the real world, I guess sometimes we do certainly do that. I, and so managing some of that pain in things that we can't do anything about. Um, you know, you watch this space in a few years, there'll be people, um, farmers that are learning about physiotherapy and 
massage techniques to to make their dogs more comfortable and work better and um and we'll be talking about that next time so one last question that i think actually finishes the whole session off really really well thank you kate um laurie what will you do differently when caring for working dogs in light of what you have found in the teammates study oh that list is endless i reckon mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's there's so many more things we're going to be able to do in the future i you know i i think there's a lot of the we collected so so much data that we still haven't crunched through yet but every time like all you gotta do is think about it sensibly um you know it's like the it's like people say well you know the dogs go to bed and they they sleep well they don't always sleep all night and they don't, you know, how many times does a cold dog get up and turn around to get warm again in the night? And so that broken sleep, I guess we, we try and we extend that a little bit from us, you know, can a dog cope with broken sleep better than a person? Well, I don't know anybody who's done that sort of um, study yet, but I guess it's not, not a hard jump to think that if you don't get a good night's sleep, that you're more likely to be tired and your muscles, not a chance to recover. And so you're more likely to injure yourself in a position where you get in a crappy night's sleep. So then immediately we think, well, what can we do to give them a better night's sleep? So if they're cold, make them warm. Um, coats, insulated kennels, bedding if they'll sleep on it. Um, you know, um, huge incidents of, of calluses and stuff. And people say, well, what does that, that doesn't matter. Calluses don't mean anything. Um, sometimes, sometimes the calluses are pretty extreme and that's the body's response to putting up um, a defense against something that's, that's uncomfortable and unpleasant. And you've got a, a bony thing that's being protected only by a little bit of skin. And so they're putting up a great big callus there to protect and pad up against that, that bony prominence. So does that matter? Well, if that's sore and uncomfortable, well, then again, they ain't sleeping that great. Um, if they didn't have those sorts of things, would they feel better? Yeah, probably. Um, so we look at getting to make, make it, the surfaces softer so that doesn't have to happen. Um, you know, some dogs suffer miserably from, from even ulcerated calluses and, um, and infection, infected calluses because they're, the pressure on the skin causes the hair follicles to rupture and then they yeah just causes problems so if we can avoid those problems that, that it's even better i mean we, the problem is we have had with working dog for many many years is we've never looked it's always been there um but you know once you once you turn your light and you shine it on it, it's like holy smoke look at there's so much like the amount of um teeth damage in working dogs amount of uh, the amount of significant number of um, musculoskeletal abnormalities well so we know those are there so then comes to what can we do to stop it and it was not that long ago that um people started to to get the, the epiphany that you know maybe those things that had rails on the back of a, a motorbike you know that were just about that high that were great for when, a, when you stopped and the dog's legs slid and he went to jump off that um, the dog stopped, the leg kept going, hmm, not such a good idea. So we'll put some chalks in there to make sure that doesn't happen. Simple thing, but until you, you look and you think about things that prevent those sort of things, God forbid we'll get into work safe for dogs, but, but we probably need to do that. Right. It sounds like that could be quite an extensive list um, <laughs> of what you <laughs> what well, you would do differently in, in caring for your for your work dogs. But I guess one of the key things that I took out of that, and I've certainly seen a lot more of it over the last few years, is is that housing in the kennels uh, that you, people have for their working dogs, and the warmth that people now have in their kennels, and the options that working dogs have at the end of the day for their comfort to be able to have a good night's sleep and um, work hard again the next day and do it, be able to do it day after day. So uh, fantastic work to see that that's been done uh, and that more people are looking to do that for their, for their own working dogs now. So 
That's awesome. Cool. So really awesome insight to the, the teammate project. Thank you, Laurie. Um, some really key things for everybody to, to be aware of when it comes to your working dogs. Um, I'm pretty sure we've only just scraped the surface of everything within this teammate project, Laurie, and uh, everything that you've done. So it's been fantastic. Um, thank you, Laurie. Really awesome. Um, you did a fantastic job <laughs> and uh, awesome amount of knowledge that you've got. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much.